Today I'm going to be reading you chapter one of Among the Hidden by Margaret Peterson Haddix. Chapter one. He saw the first tree shudder and fall, far off in the distance. Then he heard his mother call out the kitchen window, Luke, inside, now! He had never disobeyed the order to hide. Even as a toddler, barely able to walk in the backyard's tall grass, he had somehow understood the fear in his mother's voice. But on this day, the day that they began taking the woods away, he hesitated. Hi, Keelan. He took one extra breath of the fresh air scented with clover and honeysuckle and coming from far away, pine smoke. He laid his hoe down gently and savored one last moment of feeling warm soil beneath his bare feet. He reminded himself, I will never be allowed outside again. Maybe never again, as long as I live. Why? He asked at the supper table that night. It wasn't a common question in the Garner household. There were plenty of hows. How much rain did the backfield get? How's the planting going? Even what's? What'd Matthew do with the 516th wrench? Why's dad going to do? What's dad going to do about that busted tire? But why wasn't considered much worth asking. Luke asked again, why'd you have to sell the woods? Luke's dad harumphed and paused in the midst of shoveling forkfuls of boiled potatoes into his mouth. Told you before, we didn't have a choice. Government wanted it. You can't tell the government no. Mother came over and gave Luke's shoulder a reassuring squeeze before turning back to the stove. They had defied the government once with Luke. That had taken all the defiance they had in them, even more. We wouldn't have sold the woods if we hadn't had to, she said, ladling out the thick tomato we soup. The government didn't ask us if we wanted the houses there. She pursed her lips as she slid the bowls of soup onto the table. But the government's not going to live in the houses, Luke protested. At 12, he knew better, but sometimes still pictured the government as a very big, mean, fat person, two or three times as tall as an ordinary man, who went around yelling at people, not allowed, stop that. It was because of the way that his parents and older brothers talked. Government won't let us plant corn there again. Government's keeping the prices down. Government's not going to take this crop. Probably some of the people who lived in those houses will be government workers, Mother said. It'll all be city people. If he'd been allowed, Luke would have gone over to the kitchen window and peered out at the woods, trying for the umpteenth time to picture the rows and rows of houses where the firs and the maple oaks now stood or had stood. Luke knew from a sneaked peek right before supper that half the trees were now toppled. Some already lay on the ground. Some hung at weird angles from their former lofty positions in the sky. Their absence made everything look different. Like a fresh haircut exposing a band of untanned skin on a forehead. Even from deep inside the kitchen, Luke could tell the trees were missing because everything was brighter, more open, scarier. And then, when those people move in, I have to stay away from the windows? Luke asked, though he knew the answer. The question made Dad explode. He slammed his hand down on the table. Then, you gotta stay away now. Everybody and his brother's gonna be tramping around back there to see what's going on. They see you. He w <laughs> Hi, Phoebe. He waved his fork violently. Luke wasn't sure what the gesture meant, but he knew it wasn't good. No one had ever told him exactly what would happen if anyone saw him. Death? Death was what happened to the rump pigs who got stepped on by their stronger brothers and sisters. Death was a fly that stopped buzzing when the swatter hit it. He had a hard time thinking about himself in connection with the smash fly or the dead pig, gone stiff in the sun. It made his stomach feel funny, even drying. I don't think it's fair that we got to do Luke's chores now, Luke's older brother, Mark, grumbled. Can't he go outside some, maybe at night? Luke waited, hopefully, for the answer, but Dad just said no without looking up. It's not fair, Mark said again. Mark was the second son, the lucky son. Luke thought when he was feeling sorry for himself, 
Mark was two years older than Luke and barely a year younger than Matthew, the oldest. Matthew and Mark were easily recognizable as brothers with their dark hair and chiseled faces. Luke was fairer, smaller boned, soft looking. He often wondered if he looked tougher like them. Somehow he didn't think so. Luke, don't do nothing no how anyway, Matthew jeered. We won't miss his work at all. It's not my fault, Luke protested. I'd help more if mother lay her hands on his shoulders. Hush, all of you, she said. Luke will do what he can. He always has. The sound of tires on their gravel driveway came through the open window. Now who, dad started, and Luke knew the rest of the sentence. Who could that be? Why were they bothering him now? His first chance all day to sit down. It was a question that Luke always heard and heard the end of from the other side of a door. Today, skittish because of the woods coming down, he scrambled up faster than usual, dashing for the door to the back stairs. He knew without watching it that mother would take his plate from the table and hide it in the cupboard, would slide his chair back into the corner so that it looked like an unneeded spare. In three seconds, she would hide all evidence that Luke existed, just in time to step to the door and offer a weary smile to the fertilizer fertilizer salesman or the government inspector or whoever else had come to interrupt their supper.